Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Donna de Cesare. I work as a professor here at the School of Journalism and Media, and I'm really glad that you could join us tonight for this special lecture. It's part of a series of opportunities and photojournal events uh, that we're promoting with the goal of raising the profile of photojournalism and documentary photography at Moody and in the School of Journalism. You're in for a real treat tonight. Tonight's guest, Canon Explorer of Light, Lindsay Weatherspoon, will take us into her story and on a journey um, towards her becoming the exceptional photographer that she is today. Before I hand off to my colleague, Raymond Thompson, who's going to introduce our guest, I want to thank the generous <coughs> Canon, Lou Desiderio and Scott Heath, for working with Moody to bring Lindsay here to UT for a week of student centered activities and for tonight's talk. I also want to thank the program for our new, uh, our, I want to thank our chair of photojournalism, David Reef, for his support for this lecture and for the new photojournalism gallery with the, that we have as well as the new photo student contest that, we're launched, that we recently launched. It takes a community to make events like this happen and so I also want to give a big shout out to my UT colleagues, Professor Thompson, Professor Valvona, our marvelous MARCOM team, led by Kathleen Mabley and supported by Lizzie Chen and Mary Huber, um, to Keith Boner and others on our tech team for their help, uh, Larry Horvitt as well, and to our journalism staff, Lisbeth Dimer and Alex Rentz, and all the other folks and the students who have worked to support the program tonight. And so now I'll turn uh, the microphone over to my colleague, Raymond Thompson, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Hello. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and jump jump straight into this. Um, contemporary artists, uh, sorry, contemporary American artist Carrie Mae Weems said, suddenly this camera, this thing, allowed me to move around the world in a certain kind of way with a certain kind of purpose. Weems' work has consistently been a great influence on Lindsay um, way of seeing and making imagery that transform the thoughts of those who view it. Uh, however, Lindsay's first, um, sorry, Lindsay's first photography teacher and mentor was her mother, Rhonda. And much like Carrie Mae Weems and her mom, her first camera, a gift, delivered a purpose that remains strong and true to this day. Lindsay's editorial and commercial photography continues to be inspired and empowered by her, her first teacher's love and lessons. Once asked about her thoughts regarding photogra photography, Lindsay responded, as a photographer and artist, my priority is to achieve the moment when someone realized that they were making a difference through their life's journey and telling their story with pictures. Images can be described in such a way that it affects the heart of those who see it, and in that instant, the purpose of being a photographer comes full circle. Lindsay is a photojournalist and portrait is based out of Atlanta and Birmingham. Using both photography and filmmaking as, as tools to tell stories, Lindsay's work has been, has been featured in print and online in the New York Times, the USA Today, NPR, <coughs> the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Time, ESPN, and the Oprah Daily, and various publications and companies. She's also produced images for feature films, including Till, Landscape with Invisible Hand, The Color Purple, and several television shows. The fingerprints of heritage can be found on many of her assignments and personal projects featuring black queer community, Black Lives Matter, Gullah Geechee culture, Aung San players in the Negro Baseball League, and in the last of a brain, in the last of a dying breed, a shoe cobbler. Um, Lindsay's work has been exhibited in the African American Museum of, uh, in Philadelphia and Photoville, New York City. She is an awardee of the Lit List in 20, 2018. Her affiliations include Diversify Photo, the Authority Collective, Women Photograph, APA, ASMP. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Miss Lizzie, Lizzie Werberspoon. Thank you. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Raymond, and um, for that introduction, and thank you, Donna, for kicking this whole thing off. Um, I am extremely excited to be here. Photography has, has been one of the pillars of my life, and 
I honestly don't know where I'd be without it. I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to do quite a few things. And I'll be honest, like to hear my a bio read about me, I feel, I don't know, I'm just feel, I'm just filled with gratitude right now. So thank you all for coming back to campus. If you stayed on campus, now you're staying later. I appreciate you so much. And I'd also like to just say thank you to the Moody College of Communication for inviting me and Canon for um, having me as well. And shameless plug, if you want to follow me, Instagram. <laughs> you know, at one point in my life, um, I felt like I wanted to do this certain thing. And what that certain thing was, was me to just be able to talk to folks. Um, I was a shy kid, hid behind a lot of things, hid behind art. But there was something about the camera that allowed me to gravitate to so much more. Um, my mother was a photographer. I later found out that my grandmother wanted to be a photographer as well. She wanted to be um, a news writer. She wanted to work for a newspaper. But of course, the challenges of a Jim Crow era, um, a black family with 10 children, um, and just the opportunity of not having the finances was one of those things that, did, I wouldn't say deterred her, but it was a challenge for her. So it's, it just feels like it's this full circle moment to do the things that my grandmother dreamed of, my mom did, and allow me to kind of accomplish a few things, like check some things off of my list. Um, I used to be one of those kids that watched the clouds just kind of pass by and imagine what those clouds were. It saved me from being bored, but it also gave me this visual outlet of like, what, how creative can we be? What does the world look like? And in those moments, it allowed me to be free. But as I'm being free, I'm also thinking, what else can I be? What are the things that I've dreamed of that I could possibly be? And I'm like, OK, well, maybe there's this doctor thing that everybody talks about. And I'm like, nah, that ain't me. Um, maybe there's this teacher thing that people are talking about. That ain't me either. So when my mom would pull out the camera, it just felt like that moment to be free again. So in those moments, you know, I'm growing up. I have this camera. I put it to the side. I worry about school. I go to college. My college dream is to be a news anchor for the television station back at home in Birmingham, Alabama. I get to the news station. I didn't work as a news anchor, but I worked as an assignment editor doing behind the scenes stuff. And then I'm laid off two years after I'm hired. I'm like, well, that was fun. Maybe television's not it, and that's OK. Um, I also went through this, this iteration of life where I was also a college professor. I taught public speaking. And after a while, I realized as much as I was giving to students, there was still something missing. I was photographing, doing, you know, doing photography as I was accomplishing those two careers. But again, there was that twinge of, there's something else. You have this camera. What are you going to do with it? And as I looked around and realized that I did have this ability, um, I also realized that I honestly didn't know or didn't see many black women or black people as photographers. The ones that I did see were more on the fine art side or those that were on the, the journalism side or those who were shooting weddings and portraits. So I immediately walked into those worlds. That ain't me. <laughs> weddings were never me. I did it for the money. I will be honest, I enjoyed meeting people and it allowed me to kind of like capture the lives of other people. But you, at times, and you, you all will find this out either now, you either know it now, or you'll find it out later about yourself, that if it's not you, it's honestly just not you, and that's OK. So when I decided to step away from the wedding world, I found this world of, of photojournalism, and I couldn't step away. My grandma and I talk a lot, and we kind of like, pick on each other because we're both nosy people, like naturally nosy people. She's the type of person that you'll take her to Walmart, she'll sit on the bench in the front of Walmart and just watch people. I think it's the most amazing thing to do. 
Um, I, I don't do that. <laughs> but I, I appreciate the fact that she wanted to see. And in those lessons, it allowed me to see people just as they are, as different, as complex, as emotional, as quiet, as loud as they are. So as I'm looking for black people or black photographers, you know, at the time, this was around, and this sounds ancient, but it really isn't, but around 2006, that's when I graduated from college. And, you know, Google, of course, was a thing, but it wasn't as advanced as it was, as it is now. So I'm Googling, I'm like, black photographers. It's not giving me what I want. Black women photographers, it's not giving me what I want. But all of a sudden, this book pops up called Viewfinders, Black Women Photographers. And I'm like, I've never seen that book before. Um, you know, I'm kind of like a broke college student after college. Let me just go find some money to try to get this book. And when I opened this book, it literally became my personal photography Bible. I had never seen in my life that many black women that had been archived in one book. And the book is by Jean Mutisumi Ash. Um, and she's, her claim to fame is being a black woman photographer, but her husband is also the infamous Arthur Ash, um, um, tennis player. So I'm looking through this book and I'm reading everybody's bio and I'm like, we do exist. The importance of existence is real. And to finally find like my people really helped me solidify that that was the thing that I was missing when I was at these other places. You know, it was fun to, to send reporters out to different stories when I worked at um, Fox 6 in Birmingham. It was fun to talk to students about public speaking and how important it is and how you need these skills, bless you, <laughs> and how you need these skills in order to survive, because you have to talk to people. I know we text and do all these other things, but you have to literally talk to people. And it was nice to have these jobs where I may be doing weddings and portraits to where I learned how to listen, learn how to feel, learn how to be quiet. That's one of the things that we may be missing at times, to be quiet. Like qu being quiet is listening. Sometimes you don't have to say anything to get the, um, the message out to someone. So finding this book literally saved my life. And these are some of the people that I want to acknowledge. This is just an extremely short list of those folks that I researched and still read about. And matter of fact, you have two people on this list that ha are either in this area or graduated from here. You have, as I said earlier, Jimu Tsumi Ash. You have Carrie Mae Wings. Dawood Bay, Deborah Willis, Gordon Parks, Eli Reed, who is just phenomenal, who's here, right here in Austin. You have Ming Smith, my good friends, Layla Amatala Bahrain. You have Stephanie Mayling, Idris Solomon, and then you have Adrian. He is a former UT Austin student here and is doing amazing things. So you have history here right in your backyard of UT. But as we move on, um, as I said earlier, you know, there are some things that I knew that I wanted to do, but I realized stories were extremely important to me. So as we see so many images today of amazing people, you can't help to read the caption as to who made that image. Um, I, read cap more, I read captions daily because I'm always intrigued as to not only who the photographer was, but what they may have potentially been thinking at that moment. When we compose our images, and when I say we, in this instance, I'm talking about um, photographers and more specifically black photographers. When we compose our images, we bring our inspiration from those we've seen and those we follow. So I, I'm not going to make this into a lecture style. It's more of a, again, I'm talking with you. I never want to talk at people. But I want to share some images that are important to me, what has helped me shape myself as a storyteller and um, also as a creative. So it really makes a difference as to who takes the picture. Um, after working as a photographer for many years in, in different subsects, it became very ap apparent as to who was missing. And that person was me. And not me as in Lindsay Weatherspoon, but me as a black queer photographer, a black queer woman, a black queer person in this field. 
And when I think about the things that were missing and you walk into a space, it, at times it can feel lonely. Just to give you a, a, a story where I felt lonely was um, I did this story in Montgomery, Alabama. It was about Judge Roy Moore. I don't know if you're all are familiar with him, but he's the, the judge that wanted to put the um, Ten Commandments, not in the Capitol, but I forgot what building, but he wanted the Ten Commandments in, in, in his um, court courtroom. And he was making his run for the governor of Alabama. Um, so I went to the press conference, and as I'm walking in, there's this group that's huddled to the left. Like, I'm walking in the door, they're um, huddled to the left. This group of white photographers, you know, I come in, I'm happy to just be there, because, yay, I'm at work. Even though I drove three hours to Montgomery from Atlanta and have to drive right back, I'm still excited to be there. So I walk in, there's a group of white photographers, they're talking. I go over to try to speak, no one says anything. Like, cool, I have to show y'all something. So I walk, I get my things out, I'm you know, doing the work for the job. There's another group that's over on this side, still nothing. Okay, like, okay. I see what y'all are doing. So when I realized that, I was like, you know what? Let me just block that out because I came here for a specific reason. I do my job take my things out, and all of a sudden I see somebody else, his name is Elijah. Elijah walks in, he's like, hey, Lindsay. Mind you, this is a white man. Elijah is a, he's a loud, rambunctious white man, but like filled with love. And he loves his job, like both of us love our job. And it's like the minute that he spoke, then these two groups want to speak. It's like, oh, somebody had to validate me in order to make me be seen. I said, okay. I see how some of you all run your game, but it's cool. And then after they realized who I was shooting for, which coincidentally was the New York Times, then they wanted to get to know me. I'm like, God, you missed your chance. <laughs> you know, not, not to you know, be on myself, but I feel like I'm pretty good. Um, but it's those instances like that that have, they don't deter me, if anything, it's like this, this saying that I've, I've heard in the gospel song. It said, you know, you got to shake it off and pack it under your feet. Because the more that I keep building on top of it, the more that you realize that I have the confidence and the skill just like you all. So with this image and with this series, um, it was for ESPN, The Undefeated. They've now since changed names. But this series was part of what's known as the fifth quarter. And with the fifth quarter, this is when HBCUs have their battle of the bands with each other. Um, the, the cultural significance and the historic significance of this story is that being in this space with, this very intimate space with the drum major reminded me of my days in high school as a drum major. And as you all will realize, the things that you're doing now will, pre will prepare you for something later. Maybe some of the activities that you're doing now you'll probably have those skills or those things to come back up in your life. So to have this opportunity to hang out at Clark Atlanta University with the band was like one of my best times. Um, and to just not only see the drum major, but to see the drum major was a woman made it even better. Um, and she was the only one. She was the only drum major that had one drum major. So, you know, at times, it's like that last story. You have to command your respect. You have to not ask for it, you have to take it. And that's exactly what she did when she was on the field. So when you're out there, um, I, I don't know, music has always been one of my biggest inspirations. And I love just how bands and marching bands, they become family. They become permanent family. Now I have to admit, when I went to high school, my school did not have a football team, but we had a marching band. So y'all make that, y'all make sense of that. <laughs> but it was still this camaraderie. Like my friends that I had in the marching band are some of my best friends now. Um, so I think that's a testament to what family is. And then just, just this broad connection of how each section had their own thing that they do. And I'm just always appreciative when I have moments where I can share um, like this cultural significance with everybody. There is value in seeing how this narrative is shifting about how we're guiding our work 
and a lens towards an appropriate representation in the world, especially for black people as a whole. So I've met so many people, including people in my community, who have never met or have never been photographed by a black photographer. And though it's an honor to be the first at times, I often wonder what if people knew that black photographers existed? So this notion of seeing oneself is such a, sec a secluded space, and it makes all the more important when you consider who the image maker is. Um, and we'll just go from there. One of the stories that I've been working on since 2016 has been about um, a group out of the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida known as the Gullah Geechee. So Gullah Geechee folks are enslaved folks that are from West Africa. And most of them were, were brought to the states of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And this story has um, a significance to me because it's one of those cultures and communities that are beginning to disappear. Um, and the fact that it's beginning to disappear mostly because um, those who are younger that live in these cities, they've just kind of like moved past it. But you have to come back at times. You realize how important it is to come back to what you grew up with. Um, and in this instance, um, I've been, as I said, I've been working on this since 2016. And I started on it after seeing a video on Facebook. And they were talking about Gullah and Geechee folks. I'm like, OK, I've, I've seen this before. And then maybe a day or two or a week later, I had someone that followed, that friended me on Facebook, and their name was Geechee Grio. So I believe if I've seen something and it reaches out to me again, then there must be some work that I need to do with it. So I took the chance, and I met some of those folks in Darien, Georgia. Darien, Georgia is about four and a half hours from Atlanta. And while I'm down there, I'm listening to these very touching, very heroic stories about how these older folks want to make sure that their culture is, stay, is staying intact. So Mr. Charles is one of those folks that I had the opportunity to meet and, fo and obviously photograph. And what I, I love and what kind of makes me sad about this photo, I want, I'm not going to say kind of, it does make me sad about this photo, is that the house behind Mr. Charles. This house is where Mr. Charles' father was as an enslaved person. Mr. Charles was also born in this home, and he lived at least maybe two or three miles away from this particular house. Like, can you imagine? Um, you know, we talk about trauma all of the time. Can you imagine going past that all of the time and understanding, like, what has happened to you or what your father or what your family went through? Mr. Charles is no longer with us, um, but thankfully, I had the opportunity to interview him so that I have video of him. And just the, 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 the idea of being able to archive such a gentle soul, uh, such a person that, that talked about um, just his troubles. I, I think about, I guess because I, I, I'm, I'm so touched by him because I think about the stories that my grandmother is beginning to talk about and how you realize like that, that, that my grandmother will be 83 this year. And you talk and you think about what she had to the, the life that she had to exist in from now until like when she was born until now. And they tell these stories of trauma so freely because there's no notion of I've been hurt. That's like that's how things were. And so, yeah, we honor Mr. Charles. And in that same voice, in that same story, um, with that being a personal project, that allowed me to be assigned stories that are, that's connected to the Gullah Geechee culture. So this is Queen Quet. Um, she is pretty much the liaison of the um, South Carolina portion of Gullah and Geechee people. And then we also have um, one of what's called the, the ring shouters. So we made this photo together in, um, in Darien as well. And I just, I, I love how the day was that day. You know, I may have tweaked it just a little bit. But as far as like his demeanor, I don't, 
sometimes I'll pose people, but sometimes they'll stand in a place. I'm like, you know what? You look great. Let's just stay right here. And um, I just appreciate him for doing that. So there are times um, where I get to work on stories with a good group of like very powerful people. And one of those folks was Martin Luther King III. Um, I love telling this story because when I walked in his house, like the minute you walk into his home on his right hand side, it's like this cubby hole where it's original pictures of him and his family. So imagine seeing real life cracked pictures of Martin Luther King. You see Coretta Scott King, you see all of his siblings and you're just like, man, this is really happening. And you have to contain your joy because you, all of us grew up with Martin Luther King. I believe we had to come down the street to actually get here or however it is. I saw it, yeah. But, <laughs> but just to walk into this, this space of, of history has always been one thing that I don't take for granted. Um, I talk about trust a lot. People have to trust you to um, go into their homes. And when you do that, you don't take that for granted because if anything, as I asked the class earlier, do you want everybody in your house? Do you want everybody in your dorm room? Y'all do? <laughs> exactly. You don't want everybody to be in your space. So to be the photographer in this particular moment, um, I was actually quite happy with that. I mean, and he didn't rush me. A lot of people like him and, and who else do I have up here? Isabel Wilkerson. She's the, um, I photographed her for Vanity Fair. She's the author of Warmth of, of Other Sons. Um, this was at the height of the pandemic, but even though it was the height, she wanted to make sure that these photos were representative of her. And then I later found out that she personally requested that a black photographer, a black woman photographer, make these images. I just want you all to know, I know I'm honing in on this, but I want you to know the magnitude of having someone that you connect with instantly to be that person that, that pretty much archives you. Archiving and trust are the words that have always stuck out to me as far as the work goes, and I'm, I'm never going to be like forgiving of that. I, 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 I want people to know that it is an honor to archive these folks that I've either seen on TV or eventually met in person. Then I had the opportunity to photograph um, Stacey Abrams. This was also during the pandemic. Um, I, I guess I have a, a healthy ar pandemic archive, I can see. But I had the opportunity to, to photograph her for um, a magazine, just mostly about what does it mean to be not only someone who has um, run for office, but now seeing the changes during the time of 2020 when we were running, when we were voting, about to vote for a new president. And then we have Brian Stevenson. Um, Brian Stevenson blew my mind in so many ways. And he is the, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. If you all are familiar with the movie Just Mercy, this is the man that this movie was about. And he didn't, uh, we didn't have a lot of time, but the image that we were able to create together was extremely impactful. Um, and just to give you an idea of why it was impactful, he created this museum, he along with others, created this mu museum called, it, it has a, a lynching, um, lynching is tied to that museum. And each pillar that's in the museum has the names of folks that were um, essentially lynched. But what the eerie part of that museum is, is that as you start to descend on the ramp, the pillars above you look at, you have to look up at them and you have to acknowledge what happened to those folks. And in the time that we had to make this photo, I wanted to make sure that I, I showed you just the magnitude of this place. I didn't want to do anything obvious. Um, I am a person that is trauma adjacent. I try not to show the obvious, but you know what to feel when you actually read the story. Um, so we left the, the, the workhorse here because the museum wasn't even done yet. This was when they were just starting to um, open the museum. So it still had some pieces, some layers that needed to be um, put together. And we realized, when I, when I left it in there, I realized like 
in a metaphorical way, in a spiritual way, that we're still all a work in progress. So why move things when we know that it can be the exception to the photo? Um, again, when you have a photographer who's familiar with your ideas, feel familiar with just who you are as a person, you'll definitely have that moment where you're able to tell a story. To, and not, not just tell a story, but tell the deeper process of that story. Again, another 2020 photo. Um, this group, the Black Voters Matter, they were um, important in like getting people to either register to vote or making sure that people weren't uh, erased from the voter's role. We had a lot of, of those issues in Georgia where people's names were being removed um, or their voting location was being moved. So all in all, it was just one of those things that um, this is a good group to just kind of like follow around. Um, as I said earlier, I realized that um, I'm going to skip this one because it's, it's not as important. But <laughs> he's important, but it's not you know exactly what I want to say. But as I said earlier, being familiar with the people that you um, photograph and allowing those parts of yourself to shine is, is extremely valuable in the storytelling of who you are. So there was a time where I, I, I did not highlight what my um, sexuality was at, at once. And I fought myself for that because I think I was missing out on a lot of opportunities on highlighting just the importance of queer people when it comes to not just photography, but the world. So this particular couple, and I actually still stay in, in touch with them, but I was doing this story for Huff Post, and it's these two black women were at one time truck drivers. It's a very rare thing that you see. You may see it more, but you see, you didn't see it at the time that I was um, making the photograph. And I, I, I kind of struggled with how I wanted to pose them because I didn't want them to look you know, like, I don't know, whatever a typical lesbian couple looks like. It's like I wanted, I wanted to show like you have this power that no one else may ever have seen or you may not have it at all. So I wanted to just display them not only as a couple, but also as friends. So that's them. <laughs> but again, there's just that aspect of being seen. Um, Ema, I met Ema, and Ema is a, is a trans woman. And after meeting her and like settling in with her, like our conversations became so deep, so, so nurturing, because Ema taught me things I didn't even know about myself. So the power of photography, the power of understanding, the power of knowing that there is peace in what you do, but also acknowledging the things that you don't know. So when Ema put me in my place, I was like, thank you so much, Ema. I appreciate you so much. <laughs> but Ema is like this beautiful soul. And then there's this one instance, and this was pretty recent. Um, I had the opportunity to um, photograph a story for Atlanta Magazine. And in that, in that the assignment itself was to document this drag brunch that they have. And again, um, they taught me a lot. They definitely taught me about makeup. <laughs> they taught me a lot about like the consistency of their acts. They taught me a lot about like performance and just being comfortable with yourself. I think when we're put into these situations where we are just, you know, um, a fish out of water, then you, if you are uncomfortable, then there may be something, that, something else you may need to learn about yourself. Are y'all following me? Y'all good? Stars at night? They're big and bright? There you go. Exactly. Thank you so much. Somebody got it. <laughs> um, and I'm glad that we had that transition because now like the stories are beginning to be a bit more heavy. And I have to, again, I, I speak of honor a lot because um, it takes a lot to want to be in these spaces. So as I, as I was saying earlier, when there's a photographer who's familiar with the deeper and more intricate parts of a movement while making a photograph, uh, we realize that the image has a greater impact. So having similar battles, having similar triumphs, um, 
or stories tying in what it means to have someone that looks like you as you're determining how to make your photos is going to be um, one of those things that shows progression within the field of photography. So along with this connection, we also have to think about the stories that have like a deeper impact and how it not only touches black folks, but it touches all of us. Um, I worked on a store for the ProPublica. Um, and in no way am I trying to make this you know, heavy, but it's just the, the realities of the world. And with this story, um, we have a mom here whose son, whose son name was Jimmy, was um, shot and killed by the police. So I, I, had a, I had a good amount of those stories pre-George Floyd. This was all of maybe 18 or 2019. And unfortunately, his mother passed away this year. And she died without having the proper justice done for her son. So someone, and, and, and there's been plenty of questions asked me, like, how do I deal with stories like this? Um, therapy has been one of the greatest investments. Um, I definitely make sure that I move outside of what I do every day. So, you know, proper rest proper rest, <laughs> a good amount of that, um, and also just cleansing my world of, of these things. I will never escape from these things. They are reality. But for me, I have to make sure that I'm within a, a, a good headspace to continue to do my job. And the same thing goes for um, Jamarian. So Jamarian was um, in the same predicament. and. One of the things that I try my best to do with situations like this is to show these folks with dignity. We understand what has happened to Monteria's son, Jamarian. Um, but I always like to put people who are no longer with us in a place, whether that's in a spiritual place, space, or one of, um, one of obvious, just making sure that we put them back with us. I don't ever think, I never think anybody leaves us. I think folks are still here and they're still teaching us in some type of way. And then we move on to another tragic story that pretty much went around the world and that's the story of Ahmaud Arbery. Um, being commissioned by Runner's World to make these portraits of um, Ahmaud Arbery's former football coach and one of his best friends. Um, it, was, it was a bit touch and go at times, simply because it was pretty fresh. I think they were, had just caught the guys, excuse me, they had, we had just taken those guys to jail at the time. And it was pretty tense in Brunswick, Georgia. So if you go into that element and you realize like, you know, I know I need to do this work, but I also need to be precautious because obviously black person here, and then you add woman to it, it adds a completely different layer. So while I'm there, I've had, I had several issues while I was there. Again, height of 2020, June 2020, and we're traveling down there. Once we get down there, we're having issue after issue with people, with circumstances. But all in all, you know, we were grateful to have met both of these folks along with his, with Ahmaud Arbery's girlfriend who at times shied away from talking about him, but at the same time, she showed the candor of him. And again, I really do believe that people do stick with us, they stay with us, and we learn from their, um, their stories and their spirits. But when you're in the process of creating these images, especially those of diversity, I, I really need to like hone this into you all, that diversity means more than your race. It may be your sexual identity, it may be folks with disabilities, it could be body types, it could be age, it's just multiple facets of what diversity looks like. So when you're making these photos, you have to ask yourself, when you're moving about the world, or let's say your world is this campus, when you're moving around campus, you need to make sure you ask yourself, what is the reason I'm making this photo? I, I made mention um, earlier today that don't force something that doesn't feel right. You can't force a, a diverse moment. That's not how it works. You have to have the natural ability to know that all voices matter. Like they all 
matter. You put those um, black and brown voices, they are just as, port as important as what the, the predominant voice is on campus. So again, diversity is not something that you can just kind of like put in your pocket. You have to work for it. Um, and I bring that up because there have been other instances where someone, I, I had someone at, at this particular moment, and this is John Lewis, by the way, so I made this photograph of him and then had the honor of um, making the photograph of his funeral as they, the processional across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. But one image that I didn't include was when um, his body was lying in state in Georgia. And I had a white photographer, and I have to say that because it makes a difference in this story. But I had a white male photographer to approach me and said, the only reason I was hired was because I was black. And that came out of his mouth with such girth. I'm like, wow, y'all are really bold. <laughs> so when he said that to me, I'm, I'm standing there like, should I say something that I really want to say or should I keep it like PG with him? Um, I gathered him together and he quickly knew not to talk to me. But I, I, I learned that as I told that story that there were other photographers who knew who, who, knew who said it. And in my way, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking if you all are allies, if people are allies, then you have to participate as an ally. You have to say something, speak up about it. So again, um, you have to really consider what your reason is for making certain photos. Um, this photo was at an instant where there was a family in Alabama who was hit by, by COVID pretty hard. They lost two of their family members. And one of their family members is on um, their sister's earrings. You know, as I said earlier, I, I really try my best, and I'll go back to this one. I try my best to make it feel like we're leaving space for people. So I, they had a cousin and their sister to pass away. So I made sure that I left space for both of them right here. They're here somewhere, and of course not in a physical sense, but I never, again, I just don't think that people leave us. So in that, that moment, that voice, your creative voice matters as well. I know sometimes when we think about photojournalism, it has to be, and it should be, all facts. But when someone gives you the opportunity to create something that's from your heart, especially very heart-centered work, you include those folks. That's if you want to. You know, creative judgment, do what you please. But you start including those things that people um, appreciate. And I heard back from the, the, this family, and they were very appreciative as to how um, those family members were honored. You know, um, recently we've been hearing a lot about um, people and their traumas against like sexual predators. And Oraniki, Ora I met her a few years ago, um, and she's one of the co-founders of Mute R. Kelly. And I think about all of the things that have happened recently um, and how his name keeps coming up in the news. And it reminded me of the time that I, I spent with her um, I can't really put that into words, but just know that I'm glad that she had the opportunity to, to talk about those things, talk about the things that affected her mostly. There's also, you know, this, this thing where when you are in someone's space that you need to respect it. So being in um, Thomasine space in Mississippi, you know, you have that, that southern root that's attached to it. And you also realize just how valuable it is to have someone that you understand just exactly where they're coming from. I think a lot of times um, there are photographers who kind of parachute into a space and feel as if that they can take, take command over it. And sometimes with those same parachute photographers, they come into um, to areas and not exactly um, acknowledge the history or the community itself. It's just like I'm here to take rather than to give. And if anything, if you're a creative or a photographer, the, the story doesn't, how do I put this? You don't matter as the photographer. The people that you're photographing and meeting, they matter the most. So essentially, you know, I want you all to know that being a photographer is a privilege. Don't take advantage of it. I mean, I don't have anything like deeply profound to say other than that about that. <laughs>
but even in those times where I have these these moments where, um, you know, these these very sad moments, I do have happy moments. I promise I do. Really good ones. And then with this one, it was for Epilepsy Magazine and photographed Erin and her sister. Her sister, which is the one in the snakeskin dress, she's the one that's like one of her, her primary caregivers. So again, I don't know, it's like you have to have this, this, this really deep empathy for the people that you meet. Um, and then you also have to ask yourself a few questions when you come into certain spaces. You have to ask yourself, am I, am I honoring the space and these folks' feelings? Um, am I taking more than I'm listening? I would hope that you're listening more than you're taking. Um, have I established some rapport with folks? Um, my, the, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's valuable when you talk to people. Um, and this is something that you're going to be learning for quite some time. Um, you don't necessarily need to bring out your camera first. You need to be able to talk to folks, which goes back to why it was important for me to be a public speaking instructor, which goes back to why it was important for me to work at a news station. I had to learn these things in order to establish some type of rapport or relationship with folks. Also, what have I done to learn about this person? Now, we already know who this is. <laughs> But even then, celebrity or not, notable person or not, you still have to find something that you all connect on. Um, and he and I connected, what did we connect on? We knew a couple of the same people, like personally. So there's that. As mentioned earlier, there is a sole purpose um, of being a photographer, at least for myself. And all of the things that I've done as far as on a historical note has, has pretty much prepared me for other things. And one of those things was being the unit steals photographer for the movie Teal. Um, when I understood that history was always going to be around us, um, I knew that there was a purpose for saying yes to this particular job. Um, it was, there were long days, there were long nights, um, there was an instance where I really thought about leaving the film because after we had to go through the process of um, there being a mock body of Emmett Till. Are you all familiar with the Emmett Till story? Yes, okay. So after seeing, we had this, the, the scene where it was as if Emmett Till's body was brought back to Chicago. Yeah. And I... I cried the entire day. Because you have to think about, even though you know in your mind that this is not real, you know this actually happened in the world. And it's one of those unfortunate things, but I'm still like extremely grateful to have met all of the actors and the principal actors and actresses during this time. It, it definitely made me have a stronger understanding of um, not just only Emmett Till, but his mother. Like the importance of why all of this occurred. And that's one of the other photos from um, that particular story. Um, to close this out, and I have one more image after this. Um, during the time of 2020, there was like this, this movement, this passion movement that we all had. Um, some of you may have been in protest. Some of you may have participated in those things. And something just felt like I should be there. Um, and as I'm there, I'm surveying the land, but then I realize that as I'm making this particular photograph, I see another photographer. You see the other photographer in the background? Um, I see another photographer, and he's doing this the whole time. Like, hey, I'm like, if I'm in danger, the next thing, just, just push me. Don't, don't wave at me. But as I'm making the photograph, I hear him say, you're in my shot. Like, you're, you're messing up my shot. Y'all see what's happening here? <laughs> it's a whole protest going on. And not only that, I want to go back to what I said earlier about a particular gaze that people have. So um, I eventually found out who it was, but that's neither here nor there. But I have the police that's behind me. So I made this photograph with the police behind me versus his photo is going to look as if he is being accosted or arrested by the police. So when you think about the different perspectives and think about what truth 
looks like and getting the whole truth or whole story in the photo, that's going to be extremely valuable. I just recently heard a story about how um, there was a photographer who did the same to Stokely Carmichael. And then, go and then Life had, Life Magazine, which is no longer um, published, but they had um, Gordon Parks to do this whole story about Stokely Carmichael, not so much to clean up the image, but to say, this is who this person is. Because the first picture of Stokely was underlit, it was lit underneath him to make him look evil, make him look ominous. Versus this whole story that, that Gordon Parks did, again, when you have that connection to somebody, you know the things that you're about to do. So don't be that guy. That's my whole thing. Please don't be that person in, in any type of capacity. Um, be aware of what you, how you are making other people look, whether black, white, green, brown, whatever. Just be aware. But I do want to say this. When I think about photography, I think about why I started. I think about the stories that I've always wanted to tell, the stories that were near and dear to me, and they still are. And in this moment of seeing this black woman in the middle of the street during a protest, and it's almost as if like everybody cleared out just for me to photograph her, I realized that the purpose, my purpose of being not only a black photographer, but a black queer photographer, and then later on finding out that this is also um, a queer person, that it makes me feel seen. It makes me feel invaluable. It makes me feel, it makes me feel confident that eventually the stories that I'm helping to tell will be part of the history of the world. And I just got a few books that I, that I would suggest um, especially the first one being viewfinders. It's kind of hard to find, but when you do, make sure you get it. I, I have a feeling it's going to be a collector's item. Um, and then the, the last one is a more current book, As We Rise, so photography from the Black Atlantic. It has all of these stellar stories that um, I believe that you all should read. And I just want to say this quote to you all. Um, but personally, photography has enriched my life in so many ways. It is my way of telling the world how I feel about the beautiful experience of living and learning. It is a wonderful opportunity for self-expression, to bring greater understanding in our own way, to help others to understand the human condition and the world as we see it. I'd rather think I am helping to open new horizons of the mind rather than to just make beautiful photographs, which, of course, I am also trying to do. If it's art, all well and good, but I hope I'm also bringing greater understanding of how we were in the 1930s and 40s. And I share that same intimate with fellow photographer Vera Jackson, and that I hope that I am bringing that same understanding of how we were and how we are in 2023. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So um, I believe this is a Q&A moment. <laughs> Who's got a question? Come on, somebody's got a There we go. All right. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge the language that you use. I appreciate that you say I made this photograph. I think that like, really ties in with the way that you approach subjects. Um, what other language do you use to be intentional about this collaboration with you and your subject and not just taking the photo? Because to be honest, it's probably how the white photographer Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, to, to know that he said you're in my shot lets me know that he does say I took the photo. Um, take to me, in, in the instance of photography, it feels like I stole something. And I don't want to feel like I stole a moment. I feel like we made that moment together. So when, I, when my language has changed just because I'm much you know aware of things now, but I try not to call people subjects. I call them collaborators. Um, that's the one that's coming to my mind right now. But my, my, my language and my vocabulary around photography is con constantly changing. So that way, like even from, from, a, from a gender perspective, it changes there too. So I think as we evolve as these creators, our language will eventually evolve with it too. Yeah. Anybody else? All right.
Thank you. I'm wondering that um, through your experiences of photographing and working with all these people, do you notice, like, is there a shift um, when people feel that they're part of art mm -hmm. and they have these beautiful portraits that capture a part of them or share a part of them? Do you sense the shift in maybe how they see themselves? Mm. Yes, and I, 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 to, to Thank you for that question. To answer your question, yes, I recently had something like that. Um, I may have made those photos in November of last year, and the store just published maybe a week ago. And when she saw it, she's like, I've never seen myself like that. And I think that's the, the best compliment that any photographer could ever receive. Because you, as that person, saw something that they didn't even see in themselves. So. Being able to do that, um, yeah, I feel like that's the highest honor. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's valuable for us to try to connect with people um, because, again, you never want to rush a moment, no matter how much time. You may not have a lot of time, but you want to make somebody feel as if they are worth $10 million or more. Yeah, so just spending that time with them, being courteous, being conscious of them, um, and also being aware of what their apparent insecurities are. You, we can be around people and you're like, okay, well, I see what's going on. This person may not have ever had their photo taken or they're just uncomfortable. Um, but when you put them in a, a space that they know well, that makes them calm down and never leading with the camera, being able to talk before you actually make the, um, the photo. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. actually start taking a picture mm -hmm. and like relating to the person so they feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. What, I guess, do you usually try to like, how do you like converse with them so that you guys get to know each other so that they can like express themselves? Yeah, 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 good question. So the question up front was how do I essentially make people comfortable? Um, I usually do my homework on people that I can actually Google. Um, <laughs> quite honestly, and especially on, if you're on LinkedIn, I can see almost everything that you are willing to tell people. Um, but even if I don't go in with any like intel first, it's more of, of making them feel like they're family, like taking the time to, to strip away the fear of having someone make a photo of you. So it's essentially where I may find something. If we're in an area, I start talking about things. So if there is this is probably a bad example, but if there's a McDonald's around, if there's a, any type of thing that's around them, I will try to pinpoint it and try to make a conversation out of it. I mean, I know we shouldn't eat McDonald's, but I like their Big Macs. So <laughs> if it's around, I will talk about it. And then eventually, you know, the conversation may not go the way I think it would, but we're able to make it flow. So finding something that you may have some commonalities with. Yeah. Yes. Good question. The question is, how do I know when I'm not supposed to be the person that makes that photo? Um, and the answer to that is, at times I don't until I actually get there. Um, and I've had situations where I've gotten there and I'm just like, this may not be like the most optimum thing that I should do. And I'm just honest with the editor. It's like that I have these photos, um, and I'll even contact them saying, like, I may not have felt comfortable in that situation. Um, but it's just a thing of like, taking accountability for yourself and realizing that even though you may have made a photo, maybe you're just not the voice that needs to tell that story. Yeah. And I can be honest by saying that. I, I, it just wasn't a good look, um, more so because what the person said, you know, I can I can go along with a differing differing view, but his views were just so out of line with mine that it made me feel uncomfortable. And you can really tell that in the photos that I made. So it just it, it feels good to know that I now I now have the confidence to say that just wasn't it, you know, and be okay with it. Yeah. 
Um, I'll I'll make it. I'll make notice. Like I I just wasn't comfortable in that situation. Yeah. Yep. Yes. How do you balance your own ego and perspective when you're in a conversation with a subject or a collaborator, as you say? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Good question. How do I balance my personal views along with somebody else's views? I, I put on a straight face. Um, I have to just roll it off of my back and be that photojournalist, that that very middle of the road, middle of the road photojournalist and just keep it pushing that long story short. That's pretty much how I do it. Um, and then I go home and vent to some friends. But all in all, I mean, you, you're still going to have a moment where you feel like you should say something, but it's not your job. Because obviously, when I got there, that's, you know, that was the headline of the story. The whole point of it was to get this person's differing view. But I've been in so many situations these days where um, I've been in the middle of things that I know how to play the game with people, but also understand that I'm going to have to like go somewhere and have my own views checked about some things. So yeah, that's pretty much how I do it. I don't know how anybody else does it, but that's how I do it. All right, any other questions? All right, and I'll come back to you as well. All right. If you could give advice to yourself when you were just starting out, what would you tell yourself? Mm. Give me a much more specific, like in, in what space? Mm -hmm. Younger me, first, I would tell myself that it's okay to be out and proud. Like, it's not going to be a determining factor as to what you get or what you don't get. Um, the next thing would be to just make sure that you allow yourself to have confidence. Um, build that confidence. And especially being a woman, sometimes we feel like our voices can be silenced, but they're just as valuable, if not more valuable, than some other um, voices that's telling you that you can't. So just always be confident in your ability, because even if you're not where you want to be, you're still there, and your presence matters. Um, the question was about with, with the, the, the traumatic stories that I photograph, have, have I ever had to set boundaries with the um, editor? Um, no, I don't, I, I haven't, but I've had to push back on the storyline of certain things because some editors want, they want the trauma and I'm just not that person. I understand it happened, yet I know that there's another piece of you that's also important. So that's how I, that would be my hard stop. And I don't, I don't think I have to say that as much as I used to, but my hard stop is just like, I'm not gonna show something that's obvious when I know that you already have that information. Yep. Any other questions? Ah, yes. So when you pivoted your career and you started photographing people with happy stories, mm. bad stories, mm -hmm. Y'all are stomping me today. <laughs> I think uh, understanding the ebbs and flows of life um, allows me to, to stay in the middle of the road about things. You know, just as it may have been fun to photograph Ludacris, um, it was just as honorable or, um, or a good feeling to photograph someone that none of you may know. Um, so I try to put everybody on an equal plane. Like all of us have, we have our stuff. We have our lives that we are living and have lived. And so I make it a point to treat everybody pretty similar. Um, you know, I'm aware as, you know, when you have those traumatic stories, you don't want to go in 
are cheerful, but you do want to give somebody hope. So that's the ultimate goal with mostly everything. I try to treat everybody just as nicely as they're treating me. So, so yeah. I think I saw one more hand. Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, being a career photographer. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, how did you come to, uh, I guess, like, make yourself Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think the comfort of being in a, a queer community made me feel like it was okay. And it has been okay. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that I... I don't want to say that I've never experienced anything negative. Maybe I just didn't realize it. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that it doesn't come easy um, because some people may think that you may have gotten a job because of your identity or you may have gotten a job like the guy told me that I only got it because I was black. Um, but you realize like being either one is not a bad thing. It's just who I am. And when I, you know, stepped into that, then I realized that people like me need to be seen, need to be represented, need to know that it's okay to be just exactly who you are in this photography space. And I'm grateful to have met even more that I have to have this expansive idea of who they are, um, an expansive identity, so that we all can like have our own community. So community has been one of those aspects to like make me feel much more free. And, and, and explore that a bit more deeply. Um, another part of that answer is, is that now that I have, that now that I understand just what the importance of my identity is, is that I'm starting to move the, my own work more into me, like doing some inner work, doing um, self-portraits, and also doing portraits of black queer women, non-binary and trans women. And that entire project has like, really been a healing process, a cathartic process. Because again, we know that queer people existed way before us, but now it's like having the voice and the language to actually say that. So yeah, all in all, I, I believe it's extremely important to represent the things that are me versus kind of steering away from them. Yeah. Any other questions? One, well, okay. There's a possibility, um, but have I had the opportunity? Not many, but I, I always think that there's maybe that one thing that we could initially connect on. What that thing is, I don't know yet, because it's gonna be personal. Um, but I think there is an idea where you can help make photos of people that are different than you and still have like a successful approach as to who they are. Um, as you all saw, like a lot of the work has been around black folks, just putting it out there. But that doesn't mean that black people or black photographers aren't allowed or can't make images of other people. Same thing goes for y'all. You just have, I think all of us have to understand the importance of diversity and what diversity looks like. Yep. All right, thank you. Thank you.